this is a, a, a concept that I like very much. Um, it seems to me that it's also the, uh, the late motif that you uh, talk about uh, in another book, the discriminating therapist. And in that book, uh, if I understood well, it's um, you insist a lot to um, how to say to go from a, a white therapist to a how therapist, from a therapist that um, want to know why, want to uh, to search the why of things, the why of a problem, the why of depression, to a therapist that want to find the how, how does it work. And so, um, let's give a suggestion to uh, the therapists: um, how to become an how therapist, a discriminating therapist. Mm -hmm. I, th I think it starts by recognizing that right now there are more than 500 diff different forms of psychotherapy, each diff different assumptions, each with different techniques, very different viewpoints about why people have problems. And as soon as you ask why, you are inviting forming theories. And as soon as you start forming theories, is you're speculating, you're guessing, and whose guess is better than whose. It's why you have so many very sophisticated theories, but these sophisticated theories don't translate into practical psychotherapies very well. And so for me, when I wrote The Discriminating Therapist, I talked about the fact that I've been exposed to so many great theorists and their theories are very rich and very complex, and you can spend years studying the concepts and the language and all of those things, but those theories are not clients. Clients don't care about the theories. Clients just wanna get better as quickly as possible. And so the question became, would it be possible to develop a way of doing therapy that didn't involve some specific theory like psychoanalysis or cognitive therapy. And what I'm more interested in is, is how someone generates the symptoms they generate rather than trying to theorize about why. So I've been spending you know, much of my professional life de de developing this approach of sequencing, trying to understand what are the steps this person follows that generate the kinds of symptoms that they're having? How do they generate these symptoms? What do they focus on? What do they tell themselves? What are the steps that they go through that lead them into the kind of depression that they're experiencing? How, how not only uh, when, when I'm interviewing somebody, I'm really going down two paths at the same time I'm trying to identify what their skills are, what their resources are, how they're generating the symptoms and not using their skills. And the second line is, how do they work at staying the same? How do they go through life each day having new experiences, but nothing changes anything? How do they stay the same? So those questions have been very valuable in yeah. helping me identify quickly how this person generates their symptoms, what their what I call the experiential deficit is, what don't they know that's working against them, what do they know that isn't really so. And when I'm able to identify by asking that discriminating question, how do you know if it's this or if it's that? For example, how do you know if it's in your control or not? You assume it isn't, but how do you know? Yeah. And push the person, push the person to say, I really don't know. And that's what opens up, well then would you like to learn? Fantastic. And people say yes. Or how do you know if you should be feeling guilty or not? How do you know whether you're responsible for this or not? How do you know whether you should hold on to this relationship or let go of it. How do you know? And these are what are called the discrimination criteria. What evidence the person uses, what, what available information does the person use to make a decision? 
And what I find over and over and over again is people make really bad decisions because they don't know how to decide reliably. That's fantastic. I, I really I really love that and I think that's the people who will see this video will really appreciate this. So Michael, I have a, a last question. Um, you know that in the in the psychotherapy in the last years the idea of the deliberate practice is going very well. Uh, so there are many authors that are saying that it's very important to uh, practice um, outside of the, the office. Uh, so not with the clients, but um, practice the, um, the skills uh, outside in the in the world. How to say? So uh, you you do so much. Um, lessons, you do so much workshop around the world. Uh, we met for the very first time in person a few months ago at the Brief Therapy Conference. Um, so if you have to tell to psychologists, psychotherapists, and therapists in general to practice their, their skill, to do something, um, an exercise, a normal work, a task, to develop one single skill for treating um, client with depression or for treating clients in general. Uh, what do you suggest? I think the single most important two things a therapist can learn to do and practice doing is learn how to be observant without interpreting. The skill of observing without interpreting The mistakes that therapists make, the differences between therapists is in the quality of the interpretations they make. And, and the problem with therapists is they interpret things and then they believe interpretations. So I think the most important skill somebody can develop relates to what I was talking about a little while ago when I was talking about how, how people do things well. Yeah. What, I'm, what I'm aware of every day inside therapy outside therapy is that there is a world filled with people who are really good at doing something whatever it is this is somebody who is really good at keeping their desk clean here's somebody who's really good at making people feel welcome in their home when they invite guests over here's somebody who's really good at returning email promptly It doesn't matter to me what the skill is exactly, but I am intensely curious and I want to know how this person does what they do because those are the skills I'm going to need to teach somebody else. And you can't teach somebody what you don't know. You can't teach somebody what you don't know. So if you don't know how somebody is able to manage conflicts with skill, then how are you going to teach that to somebody when you start talking to them about the need to have better boundaries? Yeah. Or if, if you don't know how somebody develops greater self-awareness, then how are you going to teach that to somebody who needs to develop greater self-awareness? So, you know, the, the idea isn't to me practice more therapy techniques because if you don't know how people do the things that they do well, then what are your therapy techniques going to be about anyway? You know, you, the, yeah. the, the whole idea is therapy is largely a process of guided discovery, helping people discover what they don't know that they can learn that will make a difference in their lives, what they can experience that will make a difference in their lives. And so for me, the insights come from looking at the world around me, seeing people in my world that are really good at doing things and learning from them and asking a thousand questions about how they do this and how they do that. And of course, this, this is what led me into one of the most fascinating projects of my entire life when I got invited into a program of working with elephant conservation and how to uh, train elephant trainers and keepers using my skills in sequencing and asking how questions 
to help trainers learn how to better work around elephants in a way that's safe. It was a really unique project, and I tell the entire story on my website if somebody's interested in reading about it. Um, my website is yapko.com, Y-A-P-K-O.com. There's also a lot of information about depression and about hypnosis on the website as well. But the, the point I'm making is any therapist would need to be a curious person. Yeah. Any therapist would need to be able to recognize people who are skilled at something and know how to learn something about that person's skills in order to make it teachable to somebody else who really needs those skills. Yeah. yeah. This is a very precious valuable suggestion. I suggest to hold the therapist to follow this suggestion and to go on your website uh, in which there are many news, many products, CD, DVD and uh, books. You, as you say, you wrote over than 15 books and uh, you travel the world. So if uh, you say Michael Yapko in your country, uh, last year you were here in Italy, um, that's good to see Michael because he's very um, it, it's it's very valuable to having a class with the team. So, Michael, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I hope to see you soon here, here in Italy, also in our uh, post degree school in psychotherapy. You are one of the lecturers, and uh, thank you again for this interview. And see you next time. Thank you so much, Flavio. Appreciate it. Take Bye. care. Take care. Bye.